Welcome to DGS Biology 400 screencasting. This is Mr. Gales and today I'm going to be talking to you about the chemistry of water. When we look at, uh, take a look at this picture that we have here on the screen we see uh, a leaf uh, with water droplets on it. it. Kind of demonstrates the importance of water. We know that you know most cells are composed primarily of water and therefore living things are made up of, of mostly water. Water is an important molecule for life on earth and as a matter of fact without water we probably wouldn't be here. Uh, when you look at the water droplets on this leaf, it shows you kind of an important property of water, the, the ability for water to beat up and cling to, it, to itself. This is called cohesion that we're going to talk about in a little bit. All right, so what are we going to discuss here in terms of the chemistry of water? Well, this, this presentation really focuses on the importance of water for life on Earth. And what we'll begin with is kind of a discussion of the structure of water. Uh, understanding the structure of water is really important for all of the other properties of water that we'll discuss, which includes surface tension capillary action, temperature moderation, and the low density of ice. The next presentation will focus on water as a solvent, but that's something that's extremely important for us to touch on in terms of the importance of water, the ability to dissolve many different substances. All right, so let's begin by looking at the structure of water. On this slide, what we see here is, first of all, on the left-hand side, we see an individual water molecule here. And in that water molecule, what we're seeing is obviously the oxygen atom that is bonded to two hydrogen atoms. All right. These are, because of the rules of electronegativity that you should hopefully have, have memorized by now, this is a, uh, rule number four, where we have an oxygen atom bonded to a hydrogen atom, and that would tell us that it's going to be a polar covalent bond. Okay. This is the key idea here, polar covalent bond, because of rule four. So each one of the bonds that we see between the oxygen and the hydrogen is a polar covalent and therefore what's happening is the electrons are spending more time down here around the more electronegative oxygen atom. That gives that end of the molecule a slightly negative charge. Up at the top we see that there are uh, slight positive charges and that results from the fact that the hydrogen atoms are less electronegative and therefore the electrons are spending less time around them. That creates the slight positive charge. All right, now because of that polarity, this key idea that the polar covalent bond produces what we call polarity, because of that polarity, there's a very unique type of bond that occurs um, whenever we have polar molecules, but particularly within water molecules, and that's called a hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bonds are can be described as the weak attraction between the hydrogen atom of one molecule and a slightly negative atom within another molecule. Okay, so here what we're looking at is not just the single water molecule, but several of them interacting. And you can see that the hydrogen bond is the attraction between the slightly positive hydrogen here on one molecule and the slightly negative oxygen here on another molecule. All right, so one big thing you need to keep in mind is the water, one water molecule itself has polar covalent bonds within the molecule, and that produces the polarity that we see. Hydrogen bonding occurs between different molecules, not within the same molecule, but within different molecules. And here we see the positive hydrogen on one and the negative oxygen on another one. All right, I'm going to jump out of this for a minute, and I'm going to go to... Um, an animation which will just kind of show you the structure of water and then how hydrogen bonding occurs when water molecules come together. All right, this uh, short animation is going to take a look at the polarity of water and then hydrogen bonding that forms. All right, so here again, a very big idea is because of the polar covalent bonds that exist between the hydrogen and the oxygen, water has polar or charged ends. The electrons spend more time around the oxygen, therefore we get a partially negative charge. They spend less time around the hydrogens, and therefore that end of the molecule has a slightly positive charge. Again, this charge, you can think of it almost in terms of magnets. It allows them to interact with other molecules that are charged like this. <laughs> All 
All right, so what you see when you look at this picture, and as you saw as, as the video was animated, hydrogen bonding occurs between different molecules. So here again, between the positive hydrogen of one molecule and the negative oxygen of another molecule. That's a, a big idea to keep in mind. Hydrogen bonding is not within the same molecule, but between different molecules. And what that allows for is all kinds of properties that result from that hydrogen bonding, uh, the fact that these water molecules will stick together the way that they do. Also, the fact that they have this opposite charge, right? One end is positive and the other end is negative, is going to allow them to work like a magnet in terms of pulling other charged molecules or ions towards them. All right, I'm going to jump out of this real quickly. We're going to go back over here, and we're going to move on to the next slide. Uh, the next slide is actually just a video clip, so I'm going to uh, stop talking for a few minutes and let you watch the video. This video is really going to focus on, again, hydrogen bonding, but then some of the unique properties that result from hydrogen bonding. Water's physical properties, tough yet fluid, make it the backbone of everything from tiny cells to the world's weather systems. It's a small, simple molecule that covers 70% of the planet. It's a liquid that carves out the planet's surface and an electrically lopsided chemical that makes all life possible. And over time, it cuts like a knife. But what makes it so tough? As in much of life, the key to success is sticking together. Water's countless molecules flow as if one. And that flow has everything to do with water's electrochemical makeup. Water is something called a dipole. A dipole simply means that it's a material that has one kind of charge on one end and another kind of charge, the opposite one, on the other end. So it's got a slightly negative part over near the big fat oxygen atom, and near the hydrogen atoms, it's a slightly positive part. So this enables water to do something pretty spectacular when it's in combination with other water molecules the hydrogen parts get attracted to the oxygen part of its nearest neighbor, and so the molecules kind of squeeze together. This attraction, known as the hydrogen bond, is at the core of water's amazing properties. It makes water tough enough to provide the stiff but fluid structure of plants and animals. H2O's molecular structure also allows for a truly miraculous transformation. As water freezes into a solid, the hydrogen bonds form a crystal lattice that has a lot of empty space in it. Unlike nearly every other substance known to man, it becomes less dense as a solid than a liquid, turning traditional physics on its head. The result? Ice floats on water. Because of this, when we freeze a body of water, it freezes from the top down, not the bottom up. If ice didn't float, if water became more dense as it froze, then our ponds, our lakes, our oceans, rivers would freeze from the bottom up and would eventually be solid ice and would be much less conducive to life. The hydrogen bond enables life as we know it, but because of this bond, it takes considerable heat depending on volume, whether supplied by a stove or the sun itself, to raise water's temperature even one degree. This ability to absorb heat is known as heat capacity. Water actually has the second highest heat capacity of all of our common substances on the surface of the Earth, with ammonia actually is the only common substance that has higher heat capacity. That's why we use water in cooling our internal combustion engines, our power plants, and the human body, the evaporation and perspiration, keeps our temperature regulated. And similarly, one of the reasons that our change of seasons is gradual rather than abrupt is that water absorbs heat and releases it rather slowly. So the water on the planet tempers the change of seasons. The deep blue oceans suck up solar energy, much like the roof of a dark colored car on a sunny day acting as a planet-wide heat engine that circulates water currents, air currents, and precipitation. The sun causes water to evaporate from dewdrops, streams, ponds, oceans, and lakes. The vaporized water rises, cools, forms clouds, and eventually condenses into rain droplets or snowflakes. It all comes back down to Earth, and one way or another, whether it percolates into the groundwater or flows on the surface of lakes or streams, 
virtually all water eventually works its way back to the ocean. So what happens is in the cycle is, is it's repeated. All water on Earth has been recycled millions and millions of times. All right, so that was a look at water and some of the unique properties that we're going to discuss here in just a moment. I'm going to move on to the next slide here. On this picture, what you're seeing is a great example of property of water that is called surface tension. We've probably all seen this several times in our lives. This is a little insect that is called a water strider, and it's able to simply just walk across water because it is uh, the weight, its weight is distributed very evenly, and it, it is taking advantage of the fact that water has a very high surface tension. So what does that mean, and how, where does that surface tension come from? Let's take a look. All right, surface tension relates to another uh, property called capillary action, and that those both of those properties, again, result from the hydrogen bonding. When we look at hydrogen bonding within water molecules, for instance, the tendency of molecules of the same kind to stick together is called cohesion. So as those water molecules are, are forming hydrogen bonds one after the other, they cling to each other. That's Again, that's called cohesion. Now there's also another type of, of attraction that occurs, and that's between unlike molecules, and we call that adhesion. So when you see water droplets beating up on the surface of a leaf, the droplet, the water itself, is cohesive, and then the molecules are adhering to the leaf surface. Or if you see water molecules, uh, you know, after you have your car washed, you can see droplets of water on the hood of the car. The, the droplets of water are go undergoing cohesion, the hydrogen bonding is making them stick to each other, and then they're adhering to the surface of the car. Now a great example of surface tension and capillary action, you know, the, the attraction of water molecules to themselves, is what happens when water is pulled up through a through the, from the roots through a very large tree and then flows out through the leaves in a process called transpiration. Uh, so this is going to help us to understand how we can get water down from the ground up to the very highest trees. I mean, think about trees that are 200 feet tall. How does the water get all the way up there? And this animation that we're going to take a look at will help to explain that. The properties of water explain its movement up through a tree. As water molecules evaporate from leaves, other water molecules move by osmosis to replace them. Because of the hydrogen bonds between these polar molecules, a continuous strand of water molecules is pulled through the leaf. The molecules in the leaf are continuous with the column of water in the stem. The attraction of these molecules to polar molecules in the plant's vessels helps support the column as it is pulled up by evaporation from the leaves. The column extends into the roots. As water is pulled toward the stem and leaves, additional water moves into the roots from the soil. Thus, water is pulled up from the roots to the leaves in a continuous chain of hydrogen-bonded water molecules. So here the property of cohesion, the, the fact that the water molecules are clinging to each other, um, allows them to, to pull one after the other up through that, through that column. They're also adhering to the vessels inside the plant. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into plant structure uh, regarding cells. Um, one other thing that you're seeing here, one other property that results from this is plants that don't have woody stems, things that have what we call herbaceous stems, green stems, uh, are able to maintain upright structure because of this pressure that's exerted by the water that's traveling up through their, through their vessels. So again, those properties of water are just very, very important. All right, so we talked about surface tension and capillary action, which result from cohesion of water molecules sticking to each other, and that results from hydrogen bonding. Uh, another very important property for life on our planet that results from water's structure is temperature moderation. Because of the hydrogen bonding, water has a, a better re ability to resist, in, uh, resist temperature changes than most other substances. As you saw in the video, it's what we call heat capacity, and water can absorb quite a, uh, quite a bit of heat without changing the temperature very much. Why is this important, or how is this important? Well, if we think about 
overall temperature moderation in terms of ecosystems and climate, oceans and large lakes moderate the temperatures of nearby land areas. And we hear this oftentimes if we look at a, a news forecast or a weather forecast, sometimes you hear the, the, the phrase cooler by the lake. What's happened here in this situation, uh, when the air in the surrounding environment is very, very warm, if there's a large body of water to absorb that energy, it keeps the, the area directly around the lake a little bit cooler. What it's doing is absorbing a lot of that heat energy. Now, the opposite of that, of course, is in the, in the wintertime when the air is very, very cool, the hydrogen bonding that's in that water is going to break slowly and it's going to release that energy back into the environment. So during the wintertime, this is actually reversed where it's actually a little bit warmer, closer to bodies of water. Now, the other way that water provides temperature moderation is that um, we have something called evaporative cooling. So when your body gets very, very warm, um, you sweat. And as you sweat, what's going on is the, the sweat, the water that evaporates from your skin, leaves the surface of your skin cooler as it evaporates. All right, final property we're going to talk about here is the low density of ice. This is obviously very important because if water froze from the bottom up or if a pond froze from the bottom up then all the life at the bottom of that pond would end up dying off what we're seeing here is a comparison between liquid water and ice water solid water and we're looking at the same volume the same amount of space and what you'll notice here is in the liquid water the molecules are packed together more tightly the the hydrogen bonds are constantly being broken and reformed between them and so the molecules are packed together more closely. When hydrogen bonding forms, when solid ice is, is forming, those hydrogen bonds become fairly rigid, stable, and they actually push the, the water molecules just a little bit further away from each other. What results is that uh, ice is actually less dense than liquid water. It's in, as a matter of fact, it's approximately 10% less dense than liquid water. And the, the property we, that we see from that, of course, is we have uh, solid water ice that will float on top of liquid water. Here we can see the comparison between the three states of, of water. When it's a solid, uh, it's got less uh, density than when it's a liquid. And here we can see it as a gas as well. All right, now in the next segment of the presentation, we're going to concentrate on how water serves as a solvent to dissolve substances like sodium chloride, or if you're making Kool-Aid, you can also kind of use that same idea. All right. So remember, if you have any questions about what we've talked about here, uh, make sure you've jot jotted some questions down. You have your notes uh, ready for class, and we're going to go over some water chemistry in the next day or two. All right. This is Mr. Gale signing off. We'll talk to you later.